Thank you very much for joining us. This is the future of TV. If you're here for the social media thing, this is the wrong place. Uh, my name is Brian Marcy. I'm the uh, editor-in-chief of Digiday. I'm going to be leading this discussion at the STEAM panel. Um, perfect segue there. So first, we have Ocean McAdams. Ocean uh, comes to us from the uh, Madison Square Garden Networks. Um, next, uh, we have Josh Norman. Josh is with Bright Cove. Um, and then we have Dave Meeker. Dave is with Round Arch Isobar. So this is a very big topic. Future of TV, I mean, we could be here for days, right? So let me just start by asking a, a, a question. Please participate if you can. So if you were to compare to three years ago, would you say that your TV habits, whether it's using Apple TV, Netflix, maybe borrowing someone's HBO Go application, is significant, significantly different than, than it was three years ago? So significant difference. OK. I'm going to guess it's actually twice that number, because people don't like to participate in those questions. So uh, Ocean, uh, things are changing quite a bit. If you, were to look, if you were to look three years down the road, and I'm only going to give you a minute for this, okay? okay. Three years down the road, what, what does TV look like uh, that is different than it looks like today? Well, I, I think we can, I'll, I can talk about it in generalities, or I can talk in specifics about specifics. kind of what our, yes, about what our So give me like characteristics, like right. things that we wouldn't expect. So just, for first of all, just to give you a little bit of background. So MSG Networks, which is a regional sports network in New York, uh, I'm sure many Boston folks here are familiar with some of our teams. Uh, we're the home of the Knicks and the Rangers, which are actually owned by our company. We're also the broadcast home of the um, New Jersey Devils, the New York Islanders, the New York Red Bull, um, and the New York Liberty, and in upstate New York, we broadcast the Buffalo Sabres. So oddly, actually amazingly enough, even though the Knicks are probably our highest profile franchise, we're actually a hockey network. In fact, we broadcast on a, uh, more live hockey than any other network, um, certainly in North America, and we think in the world. Um, and so, you know, honestly, I think that while the, um, the landscape of television is changing very quickly and very dramatically, I actually don't think that our landscape is going to look dramatically different in three years than it does now. Um, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, TV sports are, you know, I think the, uh, I wouldn't call it a bulwark, but they're something that um, uh, time and time again people have sh shown to value very highly, will pay top dollar for, whether you're a cable subscriber or a cable company. Um, and uh, I don't see that changing over the next three years. I think there's a lot of things that are out there on the horizon. I think there's a lot of new technologies. I think there's a lot of new viewing uh, habits. Um, but I actually think that the way that uh, TV sports is consumed right now will be enhanced and, and improved. Okay, so you see an additive, difference. not a big, not a big threat. Three years, Everything yeah. is. Maybe if we went to the, out to the ten-year horizon, I think it would be different. But three years, I don't think it's going to look that different. Okay, Josh, what do you think? Well, not I, not specific to to Ocean because. Live sure. sports is different. I, I think that's, that's very, very true in sports. I think when you get outside of sports, you'll start to see um, a, a lot of trends start to emerge. And so more choices, more consumption available on more platforms, available as more discrete services. And you're already seeing a lot of evidence of that. Um, I think that what's interesting is, you know, there's all this sort of talk about sort of, you know, the, the death of TV. But I would argue it's, you know, we haven't had sort of more of a golden age of, of programming and content in, you know, in, in 50 years. And, um, it's, it's, while there is competition between the different channels, um, there is also a lot of evidence that consumption is just way, way up. And I, I just think about consumption in my own home. You know, I walk into the living room and you know, my, my daughter's watching linear television, my other daughter's watching a different show on her iPad, you know, my wife's on the web. You know, we're, we're all interacting with what would, people would consider traditional linear content, uh, and, but only some is being consumed uh, you know, via, via linear, others being just you know, consumed digital. So, um, consumption is way up, and that, that's a good thing for, for the industry. So, Dave, if you were to sort of look around the corner three years from now, give me some specific characteristics that, that are going to be part of the TV experience. Well, okay, so back to what Ocean said. I don't think th three, years from, three years is not a long time to do what needs to be done to radically overhaul television and the viewing experience. I think that you'll see companies, whether they be sports networks or companies like HBO, try to come up with new ways of providing content. What is content? Like right now we all think of content as the, I sit in front of a TV and I watch a video. I think that that doesn't change. I think there's additional stuff that gets produced around that to tell stories. Um, I think the other problem around you know, cord cutting 
is there's a lot of friction involved. If you try to, and I, I always call it the mom test, right? Hey mom, watch this program on the internet. She has no idea where to go with it, right? So I could give her a, a, a box she can plug in, but then she has to set it up. I mean, there's no, there's no one ubiquitous solution to making that easy for people. And then if you do make it easy, they still can't get local content, they still can't get mm -hmm. live sports. I'm not a huge sports fan, but a lot of people are, and it's prohibitive to them to going full into cord cutting until there's, an, there's some sort of new channel of delivery for sports content. I'm told there is VIPbox.tv, but that's just what I heard. But again, but yeah, agreed. You can do it. I can do, I mean, you can do a lot of things. I can control my TV with my hands, but that's because I can do it. It's not something that you just plug in and it works. Right. So, so, Ocean, on that, um, you know, let's talk about the sort of cord cutting, cord nevers. Uh, this is always a contentious topic. Um, yeah, my mom's not going to cut the cord. She's 73. She's, she's just not going to do it. However, I do have nieces who are, who are, who are sort of cord nevers. Um, and, you know, maybe it's like sort of red wine. Like, you know, if you were to judge people's behavior for when they were young, there would be no red wine market, but yet there is. Um, so is this something that's been overblown, or is this something that, that you guys get concerned about? I mean, again, I don't, I don't think it's an overblown because I think there's, you know, I, before I ended up, ended up in TV sports, I was in the music industry, and I saw how uh, an industry can be completely uh, transformed, um, some would say destroyed, uh, in, a, in a very short amount of time. So, you know, I think the television industry has looked long and hard what happened to the music business um, and has tried to learn some lessons. So I don't think that anybody is saying that um, cord cutting is not a real thing and that technology is not moving rapidly. I think, you know, what I would say, though, is that, you know, technology moves very fast, but affiliate contracts are very, very long. You know, I mean, the, you know, uh, when you look at, you know, let's say a team wanted to sell it, itself directly to, 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 uh, to, the, to the audience, getting, putting aside long uh, lead, uh, league rules, you know, you measure these contracts in decades. So, you know, that's, that's not going to change over the next few years, um, what, even, if, even if necessarily the audience wants to. And, you know, I mean, the reality around sports is that it's, um, you know, it, it's a live experience and will be for, I think, a long time. I, you know, I don't know anybody, maybe you wait five minutes before a game starts and you can, sh you know, go through some timeouts or commercials. But people, that's a, it's a, it's a community experience watching live sports and people are going to want to watch that, I think, for a long time. Yeah. Josh, do you want to take it beyond the, the, the live sports? Because I, I get it, like, you know, cable with, with live sports, it is difficult to, to, to do that outside well, of it. I, I think if you talk to, you know, Comcast, Time Warner Cable, DirecTV, about the, the cord neverers or the cord cutters, the one thing that they, they, they hope and that they, they believe is that, you know, there's this curve, and, and 15 years from now when those people are in their sort of late 30s-ish, that the convenience of cable will become very appealing. And so it will that no seems like a very dangerous bet. It really does. <laughs> and I think that um, the folks that are betting against them, or at least hedging that bet, are all of the programmers that are launching their own authenticated experience. And, and you might think that is sort of, in the one hand, in conjunction with the cable companies. But if you look at what HBO Go did, um, and I think what others are soon to follow, what, H what people don't realize what HBO you know, accomplished with Go, and you know, one, they were early. It was really expensive for them to build Go. I mean, we're, we're talking way more than people would imagine. It took multiple years, but the outcome is that they now can experiment with direct-to-consumer mm. models in markets where they don't have distribution. So that's an important point, I think, the whole direct-to-consumer thing. We're seeing this across many, many, many industries that used to rely on intermediaries between them and their customers. And for HBO, for instance, it's a really, really interesting situation because they rely on an intermediary people hate. The cable companies. People love HBO, hate their cable companies. So they seem to be building this alternative platform that maybe they're just using for their negotiations with the cable companies to cut them big checks. But it seems like they could one day just flip the switch and say, we're going direct to consumer. We're, we're they would have to, I mean, the, the amount of dollars they would have to make from the direct to consumer. Uh, model it would just be it would it, it, it wouldn't it, I mean I guarantee you they run these numbers on a daily basis mm -hmm. and I you know I, listen I don't work for HBO um, but from what I understand I mean they have found that over and over and over again the amount of people that would have to sign up would and pay a lot of money for HBO Go it just doesn't make any sense right now it may down the road and it's fantastic they built this incredible thing um, but right now the money that they get from the cable companies is just dwarfs what they would get from consumers directly. Mm -hmm. So, Dave, is there a point where sort of consumer behavior can, can 
can force this kind of change? Because a lot of the sort of arguments against TV being the way all of us probably want it, which is you know getting the things we want, paying a fair price, and not getting all the stuff we don't want, is generally entrenched business models. And usually the argument, it never starts with, I have never hear the argument about, well, consumers don't want that bundle of 900 channels they don't want. I usually hear the argument, well, that's how the business is done, and you think carriage fees and all this like very complicated stuff. It, it's a complicated industry. Um, networks are complicated. Broad, you know, delivery systems are complicated. If you were the, on the board of Comcast, and you knew how much you spent on infrastructure over the last 40 years or 30 years, there's no way that you are going to move away from that while it still works, right? It's just, it's, mm -hmm. it, because you, you end up, what do you do with all this infrastructure? Companies like an HBO or other pay services or premium services, it's, you know, we all, let's do the little poll. If you could get HBO and not have cable, who would? All right, let's triple that, right? Because we, we, we hear from everybody that, I want that. Th there's challenges to that. It's not so much of just flipping the switch and now we stream online. What happens when it doesn't work? Who do you call? So now companies like an HBO or other premium channels have to have support people and all this other business operations where right now they produce amazing content and they let somebody else deal with the dirty getting it to you part. Mm -hmm. um, in order for us to see you know, radical change, like you mentioned the music industry, f Apple did with the iPod what somebody what needs to happen in the world of TV, and everybody wants it, right? Because if you look around... Well, not everybody. Well, no, 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 <laughs> but, but companies like, look at all these emerging companies. It's small players, but it's also companies like Intel. Intel's getting into the TV space, right? So and they're finding it really difficult because the entrenched business interests uh, don't really want them to right. be. And I think that, right, so it's a changing of the guard needs to happen. And ultimately, I think what makes sense, like if we all want change, let's start changing it not from an infrastructure perspective, but from a content perspective. You make content interesting enough and across, I'm not going to use the transmedia word. It's the only time I'm going to mention it. You used, you used it. I know. How do I do that to myself? <laughs> but, but it's bigger than that. It's not just stuff across different channels. It's storytelling in new ways using technology and and that provides, right, and so the fear is how do I advertise in that world, right, when people aren't watching commercials right. as we know them, but it gives all these new opportunities. Anytime something gets disrupted, new opportunities pop up, and it's the responsibility of networks and, and writers and people at agencies to come up with what is this future content, and if we can start pushing it in that direction, perhaps there's enough momentum to where, you know, executives change, right? Seven years from now, things start to look different. And in 10 years, we are in that living room of the future. But I think between now and then, it's gonna be lots of baby steps and lots of individual approaches. Microsoft's Xbox One looks really interesting, but you have to then have, live in the Microsoft ecosystem. Like, there needs to be a standardization around, like, can it be web-based delivery, right? The internet and the web was great, because it's, it's ubiquitous and it's standards based. Um, anytime anybody's taken that approach where they're gonna go, excluding iOS and Apple, right? But when you, when you take an approach where it's, this is our world, our ecosystem, our programming, our walled garden, you're not gonna reach everybody. And TV is kind of an everybody kind of thing. We don't have one TV, we have multiple TVs. So Ocean, people always talk about, just to mention iOS, Apple sort of, getting into TV and basically I think from the sort of outsider perspective it's like, wow, wouldn't it be great for Apple to do uh, to TV what it did to the music business? The music business might. Um, why is it not gonna work like that? I mean, I, I think there's a few reasons. I mean, I think what you've seen over the last couple of years is a lot of technology companies have looked at the television business and said, it's just insane, it doesn't make any sense. We're really smart folks. We can figure this out in a much, we can build you know, a much better mousetrap. And uh, you know the the sands of the TV industry are filled with the carcasses of uh, dead animals who've tried. Uh, it's you know it's a really complicated business, and I think you know it's interesting. I mean, there's a lot of differences between the music business and the uh, television business, but I'd say probably one of the more fundamental ones is that it doesn't. It's really expensive to produce quality television, whether you're talking you know sports or whether you're talking scripted. Um, 
And you know, companies, TV companies, I mean, if you've ever been involved in the development process, they spend millions and millions of dollars um, producing shows that are terrible. Um, and they take years of, of fine tuning. And you're talking about really smart, creative people, despite what you know, most people, I think, think of the Hollywood world. There's a lot of smart, um, really creative people toiling night and day to come up with really compelling stuff. And it's expensive. Um, and the music business is not that way. You know, the technology has progressed in music where you really can create an amazing album in your living room. And I think that's one of the, there's other things, but I think- You mean me, even with the money like Netflix is spending in Amazon to create original content for their platforms? Yeah, but again, I mean, if you're a, if you're a, a TV producer or a, a production company, you're thrilled with the rise of Netflix. I mean, it's another buyer in the market. But, you know, the, I mean, they spent as, as much on House of Cards as anybody spends on television. It wasn't like that was a cheap show. That was an incredibly expensive show. Right. Um, so, uh, Josh, let's talk a little bit about, about that. I mean, because we, you know, you guys are providing the infrastructure for you know, the, the, um, a lot of this explosion of video online. Um, and I think we're moving towards this world where video is video. Right now, it's sort of divided. It's internet video and then TV. Um, do you think like online video itself has 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 really lived up on that creative side? Because it seems like you know, on the creative side, it seems the TV programming is so far outstrips what's available, uh, sort of internet native. Well, I mean, Ocean mentioned House of Cards, which obviously you know won an won an Emmy, so that's a you know kind of a groundbreaking move. But when when people think about sort of online video, they don't think of broadcast video. So there's a, definitely a perception issue. But if you talk to the broadcasters, that's not the way they think about it. And so uh, all of the broadcasters are sourcing original content, whether it's their own produced content or through acquisitions, through joint ventures, buying small studios, that is outside the reach of their MVPD and, and carrier agreements. And they're, they're doing that so that they can, uh, they can package so it differently. So can you back for MVPD? We're, we're going to... Define acronyms. The cable companies. <laughs> the cable companies. So, um, but the, the point is that they're doing that, um, to that so that they have that strategic optionality. And, and the content is amazing. And a, a great example of something that I don't think people think of as linear broadcast content, but it, but it absolutely should be, is actually um, some work that my colleague did for Comedy Central. And I think um, our other colleague from Viacom couldn't be up here today. But if anyone's seen the Comedy Central, um, the CC stand-up app, Comedy Central stand-up app, um, you know, you go in, you hit play, and what you don't realize is that, you know, video will just continue in a linear fashion for hours. It is linear programming. You don't think of it that way because you think you're hitting a clip. But they're all clips of, you know, um, tier one famous comedians that they've cleared the rights to that are, that are outside the reach of the carriers. And so effectively, uh, based on your preferences, which comedians you like or dislike or which ones you choose, your specific linear uh, feed becomes customized. That's a great example of how sort of that one-to-one -one IP experience can be customized um, and personalized that broadcast could never provide. And it's, it's the, the content is absolutely television, broadcast quality content delivered over IP in, in a very custom one-to-one -one way. And so if, by definition, if broadcast is one-to-many, IP finally gives you the option of one-to-one -one that broadcast never could. And I think that's the promise of what consumers can look forward to, and there's already some great examples of where that's being done. Yeah. So Dave, is that the sort of, oops, sorry, uh, near-term uh, opportunity rather than, I think a lot of times the internet always tries to set, set itself up as an alternative to things. Right. And in this instance, like th what this sounds like is it's just, it's an additive. It's, it's an and, not an or thing. Well, the, com the, the Comedy Central stand-up app is unique because it's, it's additive to the Comedy Central experience, but it in its own right is a unique thing. You can't get that content by, on television. Um, it's tied very closely to the brand, so somebody who loves Comedy Central and loves comedy and loves stand-up, like you can get some of that on Comedy Central, but it's not like a just tune in any time. If you like to laugh, download the app and just hit play, right? And it, it takes you, and it, it's really cool the way that the, the metadata is structured, right? So that you start to find comedians that are from the same cities or talking about the same topics. Um, it's just kind of a different approach to content, but it's almost uh, foreshadowing what can happen in a world when we deliver this one-to-one -one experience over the internet, IP, to your living room, to the big screen, right? When that just becomes a completely frictionless experience, I sit down, 
I have this one-to-one -one experience with all sorts of different types of content, and I don't have to hook, plug a wire in, I don't have to switch my AV input to something. Um, you know, for a long time, people have asked, or you have these conversations, people who aren't involved in the TV industry, why, why don't we have interactive TV? And there's, there's two thoughts. One... Wait, how do you mean interactive TV? So, well, just interactive, right? Like, when you think of it five years ago, like, and so what we do is we see, right, the ad that says push here to find out more, and it takes you to some thing that feels kind of like a web page from 10 years ago, right? It's because cable boxes are not very powerful machines. Um, they're also, to make them more powerful, is very expensive. If you have 50 million customers and you give them a subsidized box, like that costs a ton of money. So there's this cost issue that we all kind of seem to ignore. And we've been spoiled into the fact of we want free stuff, right? It's advertising supported. I just sit down and I watch. If I want, is there this, this time between now and the future where if you want that thing you want, do you, will you pay 20 bucks a month for it to something? to get that, and, and iTunes proved that the people will pay for music if you reduce the friction to getting the music you like. So that, that's, I, I wanna ask that. I mean, does the commercial model significantly change in the next, I mean, everything changes eventually, but in the next three to five years? I'll stretch it out from three years. It's already changed with Dish Network and the Hopper. Okay. Now, where does it go? I don't know. I mean, I think that's for marketers and for brands, right? That's the scariest question out there. What happens if, if there are no more TV commercials? We still know that TV commercials are the most effective way to reach people. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a very, it's a scale, right? People think, because, you know, you talk to a technologist or a millennial and they're like, commercials? I think, why would I ever watch a commercial? Right. Advertising like, doesn't work on me. <laughs> yeah. Um, You're not buying an ocean. <laughs> but, but they work. So I, I think that that's the big question. I, I, aside from content and delivery, like who cares how it gets to your house? Yeah. So right? Ocean, is that something that you guys uh, think a lot about? I mean that, you know, when I say the commercial model, that, that actually the advertising and the forms are going to change much? Yeah. I mean, you know, again, that's an area that we're, that I think is probably the most immediate, um, question that comes up all the time from, you know, is you know, as technology evolves to allow you to skip commercials, what does that mean? Um, and there's, you know, there's various ways to attack that. But as you said, it's getting rid of, you know, something that actually that works, has worked for a long time, that is incredibly lucrative, that there's a whole ecosystem built around and dump it, you know, you, you don't, you, you can't cut that out in one day and then move on to the, to the next thing. So, no, people are really trying to figure out where, where that evolves. I, you know, I don't have the, certainly the answer right now, but I certainly know that advertising will continue to exist, and there's new and innovative ways of advertising that are happening all the time. Um, you know, but how, you know, how, it, how it shapes up in the next, I mean, again, three years, not sure, but five? You know, I mean, as you said, the hopper is an incredibly important piece of technology. Mm -hmm. We are, we are seeing more and more money get spent on the digital upfronts over the past couple of years, but it still pales in comparison to what get, gets spent in the traditional upfronts. But isn't also similar advertising, though? I mean, it's, it is. it's a pre-roll ad. The formats yeah, I mean, the have not changed much, it, and you don't yeah. see that. It's even the same buyers. And, and, but it's interesting because um, there, there is, there is, it's not so much that the economics change, but it, it's who's getting the money absolutely is at risk of sort of changing. I think that's why there's such a sort of a fight over this kind of war of the living room. Um, what's interesting, though, is if you look at the, the traditional model of, of, you know, uh, of aggregating an audience and then selling advertising to it, really on, on a tonnage basis, if you think about you know, web advertising, it's CPM. We're talking about you know, millions and millions, if not billions, of impressions you know, for, for relatively small fees. It's a tonnage model. Well, that tonnage model was kind of left over from television. It's, it's impressions. It's eyeballs. Whereas in, in IP delivery, that's actually the first time you have the ability to measure, to know exactly who you're serving an ad to. Um, and and you know, the technology is not there and the measurement is not quite there if you think about the Nielsen model. But over time, it'll get there. And if the industry can think about it differently, there's the opportunity to serve you know, think about uh, you know what's what's it worth to know that you know you're going to be in this place at this time and you're in the market for a new home mortgage. You know that that's worth a lot more than a, an eight dollar CPM. Yeah. You know that that's probably you know if you ask Wells Fargo, they'd probably say, well, I'd pay eighty dollars to talk to, to you, this person. Mm -hmm. And so if, on, on a on a on a relative basis, that that's more like an eighty thousand dollar CPM. So that's so the change we should that, expect the first: the tar better targeting, basically. 
I mean, it, once the technology is there, sure, but then we have to sort of change the mindset of the industry to, to stop thinking about tonnage and start thinking about targeting this person. Yeah, okay. I, I want to open it up to questions, but first I want to do, uh, I didn't prepare you guys for this, but uh, a little fact or fiction game. So I'm going to give you sort of a statement, and you can either choose fact or fiction. Um, not it depends, please. <laughs> um, so, and then you'll have to give like, I don't know, like a Twitter size response. So we'll keep it like quick, okay. that'd be good. Uh, so Ocean, I'll start with you. Um, this is an easy one for you. Uh, millennials don't watch linear TV. Fiction, I saw the same report, I bet a lot of people here uh, <laughs> saw about 18% of millennials say they don't watch broadcast TV. I don't, I just don't believe it. I think, um, especially because I, I, my guess is that people don't think of sports as broadcast television. That's just my. There you go. Okay, I'm gonna switch up the order, Dave. Um, Twitter drives TV tune-in. Fact, but <laughs> <laughs> but amongst, it to the agency guy. <laughs> but amongst closed <laughs> ecosystems, right? Like it's not like you're going to. Twitter's not gonna break a new show off to new audiences, but it will bring a, an audience closer together. Okay, um, Josh. Uh, HBO will go direct to consumer in five years. Uh, in the, false in the in the U.S. outside the U.S. I'd say that's true. Okay. Um, we'll do one more round. Okay, Ocean. Uh, Apple and Google will significantly disrupt the TV industry. Time frame? No time frame on this one. Oh, then. Then uh, fact, absolutely. You just opened it. It's like I'm very <laughs> retired, though. <laughs> I, I think Chromecast. It's very early on, but I think Chromecast is going to be a very fascinating product to watch. Okay. And I'm all I'm waiting for my Apple TV myself. So. Okay. Uh, Josh, I'm going to go to you for this one. Um, the cable bundle is doomed. I'd say that's fact. There's just so much evidence, whether it's consumer behavior, you know, regulatory uh, pressure. Um, that you know, it, it, that's only a matter of time. But I also think that's going to change the economics of television because then, if you think about a Viacom, you know, uh, MTV or Comedy Central becomes worth you know 10x the value, and some channels that you've never heard of that you're paying for just go away. So it's it sort of it, at the end of the day, that could be bad for consumers as well because there's actually less choice. Okay, um, and the final one, Dave, is. Uh, TV ads will be bought and sold a lot like web ads are nowadays um, within five years. Uh, I, I think fact, to, but, but that's a short-lived thing. I, I think that it's reactionary and that when new platforms emerge for better content and better ways to reach people, that, we dis, that gets displaced with much more targeted one-to-one -one content relationships and things. It's, it's not the shotgun approach. Okay, we're gonna have to wrap it up there, but um, Ocean, uh, Josh, Dave, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.